Welcome to OLC 40. This is term 1B. Welcome to OLC 40. This is term 1B. We are on class 17 and we're going to be looking at assignment 26 today and prefixes. This is Tuesday, December 12th, 2022, 23, sorry. And this is Jillian Percy. All right, contact page. If you want to talk to me while I am uh, in the studio about an assignment I'm talking about, 1-800-465-7144. If you want to discuss things with me after I'm out of the studio, the office number is 1-800-667-3703. You've got a question about assignment, feel free to email me at jillian.percy at nnecschools.org. That one's probably the most reliable because I can check that at any point. Uh, if you want to re-listen to a recording, check out YouTube and I've got uh, G Percy Space Wasa. I also have all the lessons from the previous assignments uh, from term one. And I, so sorry, I deliberately played around before this even started to make sure I had this all working properly, but this seems to be a perennial problem. I apologize. Hopefully, I said it cut everything out. Okay. There we go. Biggest thing, send work to student.work at nnec.on.ca. Um, include your full name, course name, assignment number and name, and uh, rough and a good copy. Okay, today's work. We are going to understand the meaning of common prefixes, understand different types of opinion writing, understand how to write an opinion paragraph, understand the format of an opinion essay, understand the steps of the writing process as it relates to opinion essays. And you guys will have the chance, of course, to apply that understanding. And then understand the format of introductory and concluding paragraphs. Okay. So starting with grammar, what is a prefix? A prefix is a small part of a word that we add to the front of a base or root word that changes the meaning of the original word. A prefix cannot usually stand alone without a root word, as they're not usually considered words independently. There are a few exceptions to this. Uh, so some sample prefixes. If you see the word re, it means to do something over. So re-tie means to tie up your shoes again. Sub means like underwater. So submarine means a boat or a vessel that goes under the water. Over means simply over. Um, so an overpass would mean a section of a bridge that goes over a highway passage below. Um, sometimes when you add a prefix to the beginning of a verb, it will change the meaning of that verb. For example, re. Okay, so re is, is one of the most common ones. You've got things like redo, retie, repark, renew, retrace, review, rewind, reheat, repaint, rewash, reread, refill repot, reupholster, recheck. So even if you got to a new word and you saw the word re, well, you already know that re means to do something over. So it kind of, it's a, it's a way of having sort of information at your fingertips that helps you figure out new or unfamiliar words. Some other common prefixes are un, which can mean not, or it could mean to reverse something. So with the not meaning, if I say unbelief, then they don't have a belief, or unafraid, unhappy, unhealthy, unkind, unimportant, right? Some of these are like adjectives in a sense. Um, when it's applied to a verb, it can mean more like um, uh, reversing an action, untie, undo, undone, untangle, unpack, unlock, unwrap, unfold. So understanding prefixes can help you understand new or unusual words, or even words that get made up for fantasy or science fiction stories. That happens all the time, if you read those kind of books. Okay, so here are some. Um, a or an means without or lack of, like amoral, acellular, abyss, achromatic, anhydrous. Anti, uh, in this sense, means before or earlier or in front of, like antecedent, antedate, anti-meridian, anterior. This form of anti, against or opposite of. Anticlimax, anti-aircraft, antiseptic, antibody. So if say somebody is anti-military, what do I mean? I mean that 
you know, they are against the military. Um, the reason you, uh, as you come around, we're going to see some that are very similar. And it's like, why is there two different words that basically mean the same thing? And one of the reasons is because English is borrowed from a lot of different languages. Um, a lot of these are going to be coming from Greek or from Latin roots. And again, it's just that the different languages have their own meaning, but we've borrowed words. And so we end up borrowing their prefix as well. Um, auto means self or same. So you could have an autopilot, uh, autobiography, automobile, autofocus. Circum is around or about. So you can have circumvent, circumnavigate, circumscribe. Co is with or together. A co-pilot, co-worker, coexist, co-arthur. When I was young, they used to use the word cooperate, and it would have the um, have a little hyphen. Com or con with the M or in the N. Both mean the idea of together or with, companion, come mingle, contact, concentrate. Contra or contro, again, same idea means against or opposite. Contradict, contrast, contrary, controversy. Um, in some languages, the A or the O just has to do with whether a word is masculine or feminine. So they they don't change. We don't have that in English. Um, so it doesn't change the meaning at all for us. But some languages would have that as a as a crucial point. Um, here are some more. We've got D, like uh, D value, deactivate, debug, degrade, deduce, which is down or kind of off or away from. Dis is not apart or away. Disappear, disagreeable, dispot, dissect. N is to put into or cover with, and close, entangle, and slave, and case, envelope. X is like out of or from or the former. Extract, like take it out of. Exhale, it's out of your lungs. Excavate, out of the ground. X president, former president. Extra is beyond or outside or more than. So extracurricular it would be like an activity that is beyond school extramarital an affair that is outside of marriage extravagant sort of beyond the normal hetero is different or other heterosexual hetero uh heterodox heterogeneous um sometimes you'll hear somebody say they put them in uh hetero heterogeneous groups which would mean like you put People of different abilities together it has nothing to do with sexuality in that sense. Um, homo or homeo is the same or alike. A homonym, homonym, homophone, homostasis. And again, sometimes it sounds like a homeo or a homeo. It kind of depends on the, the letters that follow after, how it kind of can change the pronunciation of the first part. Hyper is over, more, beyond. Hyperactive, hypersensitive, hypercritical. Um, ill, im, in, and er all have the ID, idea of not or without, illegal, immoral, or inconsiderate, irresponsible, in or is in or into, insert, inspection, infiltrate, inter is like between or among, intersect, interstellar, intervene, interpenetrate, um, they try to enslave the alien. What does that mean? They mean they tried to, um, they tried, sorry, to put him into slavery. Okay. Yeah, put into. Okay. So there's a lot more. I'm feeling like I might say some of those for tomorrow just because there's a lot to go through. Um, and I might kind of go on to our main stuff today. Let me see here. Okay, we will come back to that. We're going to go on to the, the main stuff. So I'll make sure I get that stuff done. Okay, all about opinions. Today is our, we got this really big assignment, assignment 26. If you haven't looked at it, now is a good time. Um, and it's our first time where we're writing what they call a series of paragraphs, um, or you might call it a multi-paragraph. Basically, it's an essay. I'm not sure why they're not using the word essay. Maybe they're afraid it's intimidating, but I think we're good. We are not intimidated by that word, right? So opinions. When somebody asks your opinion on something, they want to know what you think or feel about something. 
we often explain our reasons for our ideas. And we do this all the time in everyday speech. So here are some examples. Somebody says, oh, I heard they're putting up a new fast food place on that corner. Really? What a terrible idea. That is already one of the busiest roads in the area. So here, they told you what they thought, what their opinion was, and they gave you a reason. What did you think of that movie last night? Oh, it was terrible. The acting was really poor and the plot went all over the place. It really wasn't worth seeing. So again, they told you their opinion. It was terrible. And then they told you why they thought it was terrible. So basically, that's all we're doing. We're just going to do it in writing, though. Now, sometimes opinion writing is called persuasive writing. And that's because we're often trying to persuade or convince people to do or not do something based on what we say about it. And there are all sorts of formats that use persuasive writing, advertising, letters to the editor, complaint letters to businesses, uh, grant proposals, reviews for games, books, movies, etc., opinion columns in the paper. So we're going to take a look at just some um, samples, just in case you haven't seen a lot of this. So here is one where um, the writer is a senior attorney at the Southern Environmental Law Center. And he is the leader of the National Forest and Parks Program. And there was, uh, he's responding to uh, an article that was in a magazine. And the article is called Forests Won't Save Us from Climate Change. And he's expressing his opinion about that article and about the arguments in the article. So here's what it says. Forests Won't Save Us from Climate Change argues that because of climate change driven wildfires, Forests are making the climate crisis worse, not better. But in many parts of the world, including the eastern United States, wildfires are not the biggest threat to carbon sinking forests. Logging is. As the author notes, logging releases much of the carbon stored in forests, carbon that will not be recaptured for decades or centuries at best. Yet, agencies like the U.S. Forest Service routinely target carbon-rich forests for timber projects. In North Carolina, for example, the agency recently announced plans to more than quadruple the amount of logging in the Nantahala and Pisgah National Forests without any provision to spare our oldest, healthiest, and most carbon-dense forests. Forests are and can continue to be an essential and cost-effective climate solution. But for these incredible landscapes to live up to their climate potential, we must condemn and push back on reckless policies that put mature and old growth forests and the centuries worth of carbon that they store on the chopping block. So this person's opinion is that the article was not um, not looking into all the, the details. So they're adding some of the details that they felt were left off and explaining why they disagree with the article. That's one example of opinion writing. This is another example. This is um, an opinion in the form of a movie review. This was a really long movie review, and it was about um, this guy's opinion on Barbie. So it says, by this point, Barbie has begun to do a lot more telling and a lot less showing. Its themes are presented like flat lays of Barbie outfits, delivered in lines of dialogues that are supposed to be profound, but come off as lifeless. There are still some funny gags. A line about the Kens trying to win over the Barbies by playing the guitars at them made me snort. But the good jokes are drowned out by the many self-aware ones, like the wa- like the way the Mattel executives, all men, the head boob is Will Ferrell, sit around a conference table and strategize ways to make money off selling their idea of female agency. The question we're supposed to ask as our jaws hang open is, how did the Mattel poobahs let these jokes through? But these real-life execs, counting their doubloons in advance, know that showing what good sports they are will help rather than hinder them. They're on Team Barbie after all, and they already have a long list of toy and movie tie-ins on the drawing board. So here he's um, examining, A, he doesn't think the dialogue's coming off very well. He thinks some of the jokes are um, deliberately there to kind of make people look over the fact that Barbie's planning to make a lot of money off of the Barbie movie. Um, Goes on. I'm going to skip the middle paragraph. Barbie probably is a feminist movie, but only in the most scattershot way. The plot hinges on Barbie leaving her fake world behind. And like Pinocchio and the Velveteen Rabbit before her, becoming real. Somehow, this is an improvement on her old existence. But how can we be sure? 
The movie's capstone is a montage of vintage, vintagely looking home movies. Gerwig called this footage from Barbie's cast and crew, a blur of joyful uh, childhood mem- moments and parents showing warmth and love. Is this the soon to be real Barbie's future? Or are these the doll Barbie's memories? It's impossible to tell. By this point, we're supposed to be suitably immersed in the bath of warm girls can do anything fuzzies the movie is offering us. Those bold, bold, bored little girls we saw at the very beginning of the film dashing their baby dolls against the rocks are nowhere in sight. In this Barbie land, their unruly desires are now just an inconvenience. Which is interesting because the whole take was that was supposed to show, you know, girls rebelling against traditional female roles in his um, in his uh, estimation. That isn't really what it portrayed. Now, those brave, bold girls have just disappeared, um, which is not necessarily an improvement in his mind. So that's another piece of opinion writing. Um, video game review. Uh, Subnautica. Subnautica is one of the best games ever made. Wow, they've just told you right there what their opinion is. I've played quite a few survival and resource management type games before, but nothing even comes close to Subnautica. I'm about 30 hours in and I have nothing but good things to say. The feeling you get when darkness starts creeping in is one of the most captivating and terrifying experiences a video game could possibly offer. This game might be rated E10, but it unveils some of the most unsettling parts of the human psyche. That terror serves a purpose, though, beyond just being there for the sake of it. It also paves the way for a feeling of catharsis and awe later on. The amazing places that the plot leads you and the voice acting are both top-notch, too. I've only been down around 300 meters so far, so whatever awaits me might be good or bad. But so far, this has been a wonderful experience. The development team took some really bold moves, and for that, this is an experience like no other. This isn't just the video game. This is art. I really hope they keep making sequels for the franchise. I've yet to play Sub-Zero yet. I've heard that many consider it not as good, and that's okay. I don't care if nothing ever surpasses the first game. I just want to say that I'll be very disappointed if Subnautica doesn't keep going for years to come. This is a nice one because they're talking about, A, what he likes about it. Um, He's giving you examples of things that you might enjoy. He's also talking about the future and saying, you know, I want to persuade the people that make this game to keep on making them. I think this is so different and unusual and enjoyable that even if uh, your subsequent um, sequels aren't as good, they still will be great, which is kind of a a really lovely uh, movie review. Okay, quickly. um, This is an advertisement. An advertisement is a type of persuasive writing. They're trying to convince you to buy their car. And the words appear and the image work together to try to persuade you to do what they want. If you take a look at ads at all on Google, um, you'll see older ads had a lot more writing. Um, and these days I find a lot more ads have almost no writing. So it can sometimes be kind of hard to find this kind of persuasive writing stuff. And then over here, this is kind of a public service ad, sort of. It's talking about the Surf Rider Foundation and they're trying to convince you to stop throwing garbage in the um, ocean by showing you kind of like a sushi roll, but it's wrapped up in garbage. Recent studies estimate that fish off the West Coast ingest over 12,000 tons of plastic a year. (laughs) So they are trying to persuade you not to throw your garbage into the sea. For a good cause, but it's still considered a type of persuasive or opinion essay. Okay. Okay. People can write an opinion paragraph on a topic. I'm going to talk about a paragraph first, um, just because I think it's more manageable and kind of more similar to what we've done, and then we'll kind of expand. It generally follows the same paragraph format that we've been using all along. You have a topic sentence, and you state your opinion on the topic. Then you've got detail or body sentences, where you give your reasons, evidence, or examples that support your opinion. And then you have a closing sentence, and that restates your opinion on the topic in a slightly different way than the topic sentence. So here's an example, the prompt or discussion topic. Are friends or family more important in your life? I think that friends are more important than family for a lot of different reasons. So that's my topic sentence. Then I'm gonna go into my reasons. For one thing, our friends enjoy being around us, but sometimes our own family can't stand us. Another reason is, 
because we grow up in our family, but our friends often know and meet us as adults and see us in a totally different way. In addition, families can often fight like crazy, but have no way to stop being a family. With friends, if the relationship becomes difficult and too full of fighting, you can just find new friends. And now I've got my concluding sentence. Overall, I think my friends have a lot more to do with having a healthy, happy family, happy life than my family does. Okay, so this is just an example of an opinion paragraph. Now, here's our actual um, assignment. This is assignment 26. Having your say, writing an opinion paragraph. This is worth 50 marks. This is one of our major assignments. I know sometimes people want to skip it because they think it's hard, but it really impacts your mark if you skip this, okay? Um, opinions are everywhere on billboards, in advertisements. They can be found in letters or in a CD or a movie review or in your textbooks. Why do people create opinion paragraphs or essays? These paragraphs are used to convince people to believe something or to do something. So that's their purpose, okay? Advertisers want you to believe that you need their product so you'll buy it. Politicians want to persuade you to vote for them. People who write letters to the editor want others to read their ideas and then join them in changing something about their communities. This just kind of goes over what we already talked about there, or the format. Um, okay. On the next page, they've got a sample opinion essay or a series of paragraphs from a student who wrote the Ontario Secondary School Literacy Test which is what we're doing, right? This is the, the course about it. Um, you're gonna read through it and then complete the task that follows. So this one is a multi-paragraph essay. So it's a little bit different, obviously a lot longer, but let's kind of take a look at it. So it starts off with an introductory paragraph, okay? And the topic is, is it a good idea for high school students to have a part-time job? So then she kind of dives right in. Students have a having a part-time job is a very interesting topic. In my opinion, I believe that it is a great idea for students to have part-time jobs for three main reasons. Firstly, it provides them with work experience that can be developed and further explored in future occupations. Secondly, it teaches students important personal skills and how to work socially with other coworkers. Lastly, I believe that it gives the students a chance to give back to their community. So in her introductory paragraph, she gives you the main points that she's going to write about in more detail later on. Right? She tells you first, second, and third. Okay, so then she takes that main argument and she begins to expand it. She gives you more details. She gives you an example. She gives you um, better explanations. Here's how it sounds. First of all, writing sorry, working part-time jobs at an early age allows students to develop mature skills and work experience. Going to work only when you're an adult is at a disadvantage because you have to learn everything right from scratch. When you have the ability to explore different jobs as a student, I think that you will learn lifetime experiences that you will need in future occupations. It is much easier to develop and explore new ideas as an employee when you're young so you can learn from your mistakes and use them to your advantage to build on these experiences. Altogether, I believe that working a part-time job as a student provides you with learning experiences every day. Now, I'm gonna point out, there's a couple of um, spelling mistakes in here, but it's because it's taken from a real student, so don't worry about that. I just didn't want anyone to think that meant it was how you actually spell things, okay. Secondly, along with experience, part-time jobs teach you important personable skills. Working as a student teaches you skills such as responsibility, respect for coworkers, and most importantly, social skills. You can develop these skills every day on a part-time job, but what is key is that you can improve on these skills and use them as an adult. What better way is there to learn how to treat others and take care of yourself than then to develop them at an early age? Also, working as a student allows you to learn how to manage your time efficiently. As a whole, it allows you to develop many skills needed for future jobs. Okay, so that's the end of her reasons. And now, oh, nope, sorry, there's one more reason. Finally, I think that working at a young age gives students a chance to get back to their, give back to their community. 
People are always stressing on how us teenagers do not do enough for society, and part-time jobs allow us to do this. It also allows us to provide everyday services to people. Altogether, students can get involved in their communities and give back good service to everyone. Okay, and then they don't just stop, they write a concluding paragraph. In conclusion, I believe that giving students part-time jobs is a great idea. It gets students off the streets and into great learning experiences. It not only provides us with great skills, but teaches us discipline and responsibility. It gives teenagers a chance to become personable and develop for future endeavors. So what they've done here is they restated their idea and then they restated their main arguments. Like these aren't really any different. These are the same. They've just kind of put it in different words, okay? So here is a visual of the organizational structure, not of an opinion paragraph, sorry, um, of an opinion essay. Hang on a second. They keep using the phrase a series of paragraphs, which I find really clunky. Um, introductory paragraph, first argument or reason with examples and details, second argument or reason with examples and details, third argument or reason with examples and details, and then your concluding paragraph. And you can kind of see how it's got that hamburger format, right? We've got our buns that echo each other. And we've got our stuff inside, our meat, our tomato, our lettuce, all our juicy details that make people want to eat the hamburger or buy our arguments. So here are our two choices. You do not have to do both. You pick one and your entire essay is going to be about that one art, that one opinion. So one, men should be forced by law to financially support any children you have, or young people who return from juvenile de detention should have to complete community service hours and write a letter of apology for past behaviors. Now remember, you can agree or you can disagree, right? You do not have to agree with everything here. Record your thoughts and ideas. Now that you've had a chance to think about whether you agree or disagree with one of the statements, it's time to begin the process of writing your own opinion piece. It will be at least four paragraphs in length, and you must use the writing process. When you are done, your opinion will be a page in length hang handwritten. The draft or rough copy should be handwritten, while your final copy can be either neatly handwritten or on a computer printout. Be sure to show that you've done some revising and editing with your rough copy. Now, the rough copy of this is worth 20 marks, and the final copy is worth 30 marks for a total of 50. I do expect to see um, a lot of revisions between the rough and the final copy, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Oh, we're, we're, we've got some time. Okay, so choosing a topic. If you're having trouble thinking about which topic you want to choose, just set up a quick chart for yourself with one topic on one side and then one topic on the other side. Set a timer for five or 10 minutes and just start writing down as many ideas as you can for the one topic. Then reset the timer for another five minutes and try to write as many ideas as you can for the other topic. Then kind of step back and look at what you got. Which ideas came more easily? Which ones do you have more ideas and examples for? Which one do you feel more passionately about, either for or against? Often doing a little bit of quick pre-writing here can make which topic you feel more comfortable writing about very obvious because you don't want to get halfway through and just suddenly go, oh, I just don't have enough to say about this, right? Um, brainstorming your ideas for the essay. So I'm going to use a different example just to kind of give you some, uh, like a little demo of how to do this. So I'm going to write on the topic why I am against capital punishment, which is the death penalty. So my big ideas for this were police and the courts can make honest mistakes. Dishonest police lawyers and judges could use it to deliberately punish innocent people that they have a vendetta against. Politicians could use it to silence those who disagree with them. Sometimes real evidence that could clear someone's name is not allowed in for procedural reasons so that innocent people are not able to clear the name. And it will have a negative effect on police lawyers and judges who find themselves in the position of assigning death penalty when they know the person is innocent and the negative effects it has on those who have to carry out the sentence. Now, I may not need all of those ideas. Well, I'm just kind of listing all my possible ideas 
And then I'm going to go back and think about, okay, so which one of these do I think I could really um, write a good paragraph on? Because some of them I just don't, may not have enough to say about. Um, so after you pick three that you think are your really strongest arguments or that you've got a lot to say about, then you can go through and start to think about what all those arguments are. It's really, really important when you're doing a longer piece of writing like this to spend a little more time planning and brainstorming. And this kind of frees you up to think about how to say things effectively rather than just thinking about what to say, okay? So I've got a bunch of ideas here for my first argument. Police and the courts can make honest mistakes. Sometimes circumstantial evidence is the main source of a conviction. Number two, sometimes even evidence just DNA may have come onto the crime scene for an unexpected reason. Uh, three, sometimes lawyers are too busy to defend clients, especially poor ones, properly. Sometimes lawyers may make a mistake or have antagonized a judge who may rule against them for those reasons. And new evidence may appear later that clears them of the crime. Number two, dishonest police, lawyers, judges, and authorities could use it to deliberately punish innocent people that they have a vendetta against. Uh, politicians might get cops or lawyers they know to trump up charges against political opponents. Racist or sexist authorities might deliberately use it to be harder on those they have prejudiced against for other reasons. There's lots of evidence that that's what has happening and has happened for a long time. Uh, the threat of capital punishment might be used to get people to do criminal acts they don't want to in order to avoid death. Uh, number three, uh, the effects that it has on those who have to carry out the sentence. Someone has to be the execution executioner and bear the guilt, even if they didn't have any responsibility for the decision. Sometimes new evidence shows up later and the executioner could carry extra guilt. The executioners might get used to killing or even enjoy and begin killing people other, other people off the job. Sometimes the methods that are used fail to work in some ways, and the person ends up tortured rather than killed. Okay, so on the previous slide, I picked my three strongest reasons, and I tried to add details and examples that I can use to write my essay. Now I'm going to use these to write my introduction, and we're going to still use a paragraph format. So here I've listed my three. Uh, police and courts can make honest mistakes. Corrupt authorities can use it to control and harm others. Negative effects on the person whose job it becomes killing others. So I'm going to start with an opening sentence. And I want to state my opinion in that opening sentence. I don't believe that capital punishment is a good punishment for crime, even if it initially seems like a, sp a fair response. For one thing, the police and the court system can make honest mistakes and accidentally condemn those who might really be innocent. Another concern is that corrupt authorities can use the threat of capital punishment to control and harm others. Finally, I believe it has a negative effect on the executioner and all of those involved whose job has become to kill someone in cold blood. And then I've got a closing sentence which kind of summarizes this. These are my concerns that would lead me to vote against capital punishment as a response to crime. Okay. Now... So that was, hang on. Okay, so this is my introductory um, uh, paragraph. Now I'm gonna write one of my body paragraphs. So here's my rough ideas, and I'm gonna take those and use them to write my paragraph, okay? So I literally would have these side by side. I would have the one paper next to me with my rough ideas, and then I would have the paper in front of me where I'm writing my rough draft, okay? Um, and this is called a body paragraph where you're uh, basically giving all the details, really kind of fleshing out your main idea, okay? Another reason I am against capital punishment is the negative effect it has on those who do, who have to do the actual killing. We tend not to think about the fact that ultimately there is a person who will have to carry out this legal sentence. Sometimes the methods used to, per to execute prisoners may fail, and a person ends up in prolonged agony, which makes the executioner an accomplice to something that amounts to torture. As well, the executioner may struggle with guilt over doing the killing, even if they agree with the sentence. 
Occasionally, new evidence comes up that proves a condemned prisoner was actually innocent, which can cause the executioner mental anguish. On the other hand, they may come to enjoy killing or feel like they are above the law and begin killing others for fun. I feel like the overall effect on those who we hire to carry out our sentences of death is very harmful to them as human beings. So I still am using that paragraph format. I gave my intro. I explained in more detail why I have that belief. And then I conclude it. So I would do that for each of my big ideas, okay? Hopefully you should have two or three, preferably three, okay? Um, then after I write all my other body paragraphs, I'm going to need to write a closing paragraph. And it needs to kind of echo and restate my introductory paragraph, but without just repeating myself word for word. So here is where synonyms and rephrasing can be very helpful. So again, right there, I've got my introductory paragraph right there so people can see it. And then I wrote from looking at that. Uh, I have highlighted the opening and closing sentences in both just so that you see that pattern. And we try as much as possible to do it every time, okay? However, you don't have to highlight yours when you hand them in. It just, do you need, need to be aware? I will look for it. It is a key point, And I definitely mark people down if I don't see a closing sentence in every paragraph, okay? So I restated my idea. Ultimately, I believe that advocating for capital punishment as an effective response response to crime overlooks many problems with carrying it out. Um, and then I, I kind of went word for word. So now I changed things slightly, right? For one thing, or I hear I put in the real world, the police and the lawyers make mistakes that can condemn innocent people. In the real world, there are some politicians, judges, and cops who are corrupt or even evil, and who would use capital punishment or even the threat of it to harm and control others. Now, I'm going to say that's not the greatest sentence. This is my rough draft, though, but I would, I would fix that. Finally, in the real world, the sentence written on paper that seems so abstract must be carried out by real people who will have to live with the guilt, the mistakes, and the corroding effect of being hired to kill. Together, these reasons seem too great to include it as a proper response in a society that has to be carried out by humans with all of our faults. So again, this is just my rough draft. I could now go one step further and make this sound even better. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to um, duplicate that slide. Hang on a second. Duplicate the slide. I'm going to take off my rough copy. Take that off. I'm just kind of making room basically. So here is here, and I'm gonna call this rough to good copy because here is where, kind of where the rubber meets, meets the road, okay? Um, I find a lot of people find this step the most challenging step, okay? And basically all I'm doing is trying to make it sound better, but I'm also looking for issues where it's not clear, or issues where the punctuation isn't quite right, or whatever I can do to make it sound better, okay? Now, in fairness, I played with this a lot before I got this, so I don't know, will I be able to make it sound better or not? I gotta be honest, um, but I am gonna tackle it, okay? So, I like the phrase, I like my first sentence a lot. I think ultimately is a great one to use in my, complete, my completing, my concluding paragraph, but I could say in conclusion or finally or overall, um, in this case, I'm not gonna use ultimately because I just like it. I believe that advocating for capital punishment, I don't like that phrase though. I believe that capital punishment, um, let's see as a sentence for murder overlooks the many problems that occur in carrying carrying it out. I don't I still don't like that phrase, but I'm not sure how to fix it right now. 
this is one of those things where I might go back again and try and fix that. I don't like that phrase, but I'm not sure how else to say it. I do really, really like in the real world, in the, sorry, in the real world, uh, the police can make mistakes that condemn innocent people. I thought about leaving the lawyer thing in, but I feel like, I don't know, just it seems more uh, condensed by just having the police. I could I could change my mind on that one. Um, and I'm gonna echo the in the real world. Also, also in the real world, uh, corrupt people, corrupt or yeah corrupt people i'll say the stand for corrupt people could use capital punishment to threaten or harm others or control them or even control them even control them. I liked summarizing uh, politicians, judges, and cops into corrupt people. I just think it's a little more concise again. Um, finally, in the real world, um, the, let's see, hmm, the sentence, what do I say? The, um, I don't know what to call it, uh, the jail sentence? Uh, the jail sentence, which seems like words on paper, seems like just words, ha ha ha, just words on paper, must be made real by people who cannot help but carry the guilt, the shame, and the corroding effect of killing for a living. Okay, so I still have to do my conclusion sentence, and I want to kind of uh, do it. And again, I might go over this at another time. I want it to sound as good as possible. Okay. Together, if I say, okay, so great used to mean um, like big, but sometimes these days it's become the like a synonym for good. And I don't want it to get mistaken here. Okay. I was thinking of the old meaning, but it's kind of developed a newer meaning and I don't want it to get um, misunderstood. So together, these reasons seem too terrifying, terrible, terrible, to include it in a society that is all too aware of our human faults and evils. Okay. Does this still possibly have some mistakes? Sure. Do I think I've made it a little bit better? Yes. I haven't just changed a word or two. I've tried to fundamentally rephrase and make things better. I really, really ask between your rough copy and your good copy, please take the time to, to really try and polish up your words and make them sound stronger. Okay. Um, okay. So here is a checklist for a series of paragraphs expressing an opinion. This part about reading, I'm not sure why it's included because you aren't really reading. You do want to make sure you've done your planning. Um, the big thing here is introductory paragraph, three body paragraphs, concluding paragraph. Make sure it shows that you understand what you're talking about. Uh, you've conveyed an effective tone, uh, used connecting words and linking sentences and organize the ideas clearly so my reader can follow and understand my opinion. Revising and editing. This is the big thing I look for 
in the good copy. A lot of people lose marks in the good copy because they haven't really made enough changes. I look that you've used the writing process to revise your work, that you've created an opinion paragraph that will appeal to your audience and hopefully convince them. It meets your purpose. You've checked for grammar, spelling, and punctuation. And uh, for the final stage, you've given me a neat readable copy, whether it's handwritten or in um, a computer, and you need to give it a title, okay? It could be something really simple like, uh, I, you know, um, a restatement basically of your opinion, but it does need to be there. Now, this is checklist is for you. This rubric is for me. This is what you'll see when I hand things back. And basically we look at four main areas. This is true for basically anything in, um, in English. These are, the, these are the ministry guidelines for what we're supposed to be looking for. The first category is knowledge understanding. I'm looking for your understanding of how to write opinion paragraphs and essay and understanding of any resource materials read. I don't know that you might necessarily read some things, but you might. Uh, critical and creative thinking skills. That's where you're developing your ideas, you're selecting your good ones, you're evaluating, you're organizing your information, you're explaining things. Then communication, the communication of information ideas, communication for audience and purpose. And then it links back to um, the use of the form of opinion paragraphs. Yeah, you may demonstrate that you know it, but did you, it says here, limited control, moderate control. So in other words, you knew it, are you able to apply it effectively and well? And the last one is looking at different ways of, of application. Language conventions like spelling and punctuation, application of reading strategies. I don't think that's a huge part of this one. Application of the writing process, absolutely. Application of literacy skills. That's just kind of a generic catch-all for all the different things, right? Um, how are we doing? Good, we got three minutes. After you have the rough draft, you can do the revisions. Look for places you need to make your meaning more clear, places where you need to add an example of your meaning, or places where you could add more details to that example. Check your sentence structure to make sure you've got complete sentences. Check that you don't have run-on sentences. That normally happens when people are joining sentences together with a comma instead of a period. And then remember to use transition words at the beginning of sentences. So here is a sample of some possible transition words you could use. First, second, third, fourth, next, then after that, in addition, also as well, for example, as an example. Now, these ones, sometimes people try and use these at the beginning of a sentence. They really aren't, they aren't really supposed to be. They're meant to join two sentences together. So it makes more sense for them to be in the middle. So for the moment, I would suggest doing it that way. There is, it isn't, you know, it isn't a hard and fast rule, but it is a good idea. So words like but, although, however, therefore, since, and because. So these first three are kind of contrasting things. Yes, this, but that. These um, next ones are kind of talking about cause and effect, right? If this, then that. Since this, then that. Okay. Uh, it's important to write, when you're writing a paragraph, to have a mixture of sentence structures and length. A series of short, simple sentences can sound choppy and incomplete. Um, a series of consistently long, complex and compound sentences can make it hard to follow the ideas or arguments. And it can also be somewhat off-putting to read. So if you tend to write a lot of short sentences, think about how to start combining some of them to make your paragraph more interesting. And if you tend to write long, convoluted sentences, think about how to shorten or condense some of your sentences so the paragraph is easier to understand. Now, I find most people tend towards writing sentences that are too long, where they've basically shoved like, four or five sentences together to create one sentence. So we're gonna, oh, that's our time is more or less up. Um, I will leave this up for you. Uh, this is um, an example of writing where there's too many long sentences and they wanna know whether they can fix it. And again, my big goal, if I was looking at something that's too long is periods, okay? 
oftentimes people are using periods, not commas. Um, or there are too many ideas in one sentence. It's okay to try and link two ideas, but if you're doing more than that, it's going to get really confusing for your reader. It's not impossible, but it will get confusing. All right, we will talk some more uh, tomorrow. We'll be moving on to assignment 27. We're getting close to the end of unit two. Thank you so much for joining me today and I will talk to you guys tomorrow.